Finance New Orleans Finance and Investments Committee meeting roll call. Chair G. Wade Wooten. Present. Mr. Charles H. Brown. Present. Mr. Hunter Thomas. Here. A quorum is present. Give me a second. I'm trying to find my talking notes. Do we do the talking notes for this or is it just the board? Yeah, it's just the board. Okay. Whew. Yeah. The winner couldn't find it. I'll, I'll cover I'll cover it this time. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Okay, bye. Yeah, I I'm think just... uh Naj is gonna put up the agenda. Let me know if you guys don't see it. I have it up. I can see yeah. it. Thank you. Okay, so uh, since we've got a quorum, it looks like there's uh, a roll call. There's no old business, and then it's just a matter of rolling to uh, new business and a review of our uh, committee meeting minutes from August 17th, 2021. I don't think there was any, there were any action items. I think it was just reports. That makes it easier. To assess. I always forget at the committee level, it's just a matter of voting to receive the minutes, the committee meeting minutes as drafted. I think that's what we tell. We accept. Okay, makes sense. So is there a motion to accept the uh, minutes from the April, August 17, 2021 Finance and Investment Committee mi meeting minutes? Hunter, I wasn't there. I'll second. I move to accept the minutes. Second. Okay, great. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Oppo opposed? I've read them. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Okay, so it passes unanim unanimously. Um, Got some background coming in from somewhere. It could be, it could be me. I'm actually had, I had to pitch camp. I'm not in my office, so. Okay. Um, and then I guess the preliminary budget uh, for FY21-22 uh, is in draft mode. Byron, is there an attachment we're supposed to review or? Yeah, so I'm, no, I'm going to share my screen. Okay. And talk through it. Uh, so, Naj, if you can allow me to share my screen. All right. I had asked about that uh, with Elizabeth that I didn't see the draft as an attachment. All right. Uh, so can you see my screen? Yes. All right. So, so good afternoon, committee members. Oh. Mr. Brown, can you see the screen? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, it, it is, That's this is preliminary. I did not, I'm sorry. Single ahead. family program income, right? Yes, sir. Okay. So, so this is preliminary and I can share this after the meeting, but uh, but yes, it wasn't included in, in the package, but um, but I did want to let the committee know that the budget planning and development for the, the FY22 is underway. Um, the cycle started with, um, you know, basically looking, I looked at the projections for the current year, uh, developed some budget schedules and some templates and was able to schedule some budget meetings with our leadership team. And in those budget meetings, we, we looked at the year-to-date information for the first nine months um, for this year. Uh, we coupled that with projections just regarding activities that we anticipate for the remainder of the fiscal year. Um, so this is kind of a almost like a mid-year review. Um, but we also just covered some of the current year action items, some of the priorities that we're thinking about for the next year. 
and then just other initiatives and, and wish list items that, you know, uh, we see for the next year as well. So um, the idea going into the cycle was to just kind of make sure that we're, we're, you know, looking at the budget and linking it to our strategic plan, to our initiatives and to our goals, because we know this will help set the foundation for making, you know, prudent decisions and making sure we're aligned as an organization, making sure we enhance in our communication and clarification around our roles and just improve our overall accountability. So, you know, today I just wanted to introduce the budget to the committee as a first pass of the budget. Um, it is based on some, like I said, some preliminary assumptions and discussions that we've had to this point. Um, the budget is generally adopted in December of each year. Um, so you will have a few opportunities to see the budget and make recommendations before then. Um, I'll also provide and, and, and go over more detailed and, and, and a look at our forward projections for the, the next few years. Um, we'll probably look at that in the board retreat. Um, and then there, there's possibly some changes that may arise out of the board retreat discussion as well. So you'll probably see another iteration or a few more um, of this before uh, going to approve December. Um, so, you know, I just want to, I guess for, for today's meeting, I want to look at and, and talk through um, you know, where we are right now, what we're estimating or where we're estimating to end for the year. Look at that estimate versus uh, our current year budget. And then we can just kind of touch on the, high, the first pass of the budget and walk through that. So you'll see uh, the, re the report on my screen, it does have the first column. And this is basically our income and our revenue, I mean, our, our revenues and our expenses. Uh, that we typically look at, um, you know, on a monthly basis. But this shows our budget for this year. It shows where we're estimating to end up for the year. It shows our estimate versus budget. Then it shows our first pass of the 2022 budget. And then there's a dollar and a percentage per comparison to the 2021 budget. So looking at the income line, you'll see, you know, we budgeted roughly 402,000 uh, in revenues for 2021. Uh, we're estimating uh, that we'll come in above budget at 446,000. And that's primarily driven by the multifamily program income, our sustainable development program uh, with our pilot and bond fees. And so um, we know we closed one earlier this year. We actually have four. Uh, that's in process right now. If we can get those those four closed, that'll be five. And that number that you see, that three hundred and fifty five thousand, is based on closing those five pilots for the year, as well as the recurring revenue that we received from the the two pilots we closed in twenty twenty. Uh, so you'll see that's our bread and butter there. Um, that's that was pretty much the driver for the the revenue side. Um, for this year based on, you know, uh, the, an estimate. Um, that was offset by the other revenue where we had a slight miss. Uh, and that was, that's just driven by uh, interest rates and the interest income that we receive on our, our, uh, our bank accounts and our investments. So um, that's where that, that, that miss was there. And single family is kind of right on, on board. Um, <clears throat> and then moving into, next year you know and just having discussions internally we think that we can do at least seven pilots next year um well before moving to that on a single family side um there's program and origination related fees and we know we're revving up we're just getting that that program off the ground uh we have uh you know and speaking with with kelly uh, and the programs team, she has an idea of the amount of mortgages she can originate and we can produce. Um, and so based on that number, uh, that's where, you know, we're budgeting right now, uh, 68,000 in that single family line. And moving back to that multifamily line, we're budgeting seven pilots here. Um, once again, 
that will include the recurring revenue from the previous pilots plus the the um, the origination fees that come from uh, closing seven pilots for next year. And then in the other revenue line, um, there is there is some lease revenue that we receive this year that we won't receive last year. So you'll see that line is reduced. Um, but in the details, the, the interest line has been increased slightly because we know um, there's a possibility that um, interest rates may rise a little bit. So we may generate a little bit more um, juice in that area. All right, moving to the expense side. So looking at the employees and salaries and benefits line, we budgeted one point, roughly 1.3. Um, we're estimating to land at 1.2. So there is favorability there. The main driver is because it is based on the timing of us onboarding our new employees. Uh, and we did have a, a headcount reduction in the year. So uh, that's the driver for that, that favorability there. Um, for this iteration, uh, the budget is set flat um, to where the 2021 budget is at this time. Administrative expenses, you'll see there's favorability there. We budgeted 95,000 to uh, an estimate of 57,000. Uh, the subcategories that flow up to this particular line item is our, um, mainly that drives this line is our, our travel. We also have training uh, and professional development coming out of this line, but uh, as we all are aware, we, we were in a uh, remote environment and, and travel was restricted. So. Um, that's the driver there. Um, I did scale this line down slightly. Um, there is some retirement plan administration fees that, um, that came in lower. So there's, there's lower fees there and just overall scale down uh, slightly and, and travel there. Next line is the operating and maintenance expense line. There's a lot of subcategories here. Um, Mainly, uh, there's supplies, there's uh, cleaning expenses, there's equipment leases, um, but one of the biggest line items is a, a, a other operating line. It's just the other operating line that we, uh, we well, I pulled um, the community support funds uh, when we decided to, to start that program. That wasn't budgeted for when we, that was after the budget was uh, was developed. And so um, that other line that had availability was where I placed that. Moving forward, uh, that's going to be a separate line as we, you know, uh, leverage that into its own fund. Uh, but the main driver and the favorability there is is driven by that community, community support expense not being in that line item. So you'll see the, uh, the 2022 first pass budget number is 234000 then we have consultant and professional services. This line consists, of course, of our consultants. We have our, um, our auditors in this line. We have um, our general counsel, our program consultants. Uh, we have Kane Mitter, our investment consultant. They all flow through this line. Uh, we did have some HR uh, consultants early in the year. Uh, that kind of uh, pushed us over uh, our budget a little bit, um, or possibly pushed us over um, a little bit that we did not uh, have in the budget. So you'll see there's, uh, we have an overage there of 60,000. Um, moving to this first pass line, uh, that number has been scaled down uh, by roughly 18%. Then we have the business development line. Uh, you'll see we're at 70,000 budget to an estimated 64. So we're very close, um, you know, favorable by 6,000, but very close right in line. Uh, this is our program uh, development. Uh, there's sponsorships that flow through this line. And so um, I scaled that down roughly by 7% uh, to 65,000 in this iteration. Then we have utilities. Uh, 21 to uh, an estimate of 30,000 and, you know, utilities is one of those things that, you know, kind of hard to control. So 
uh, we did see a slight increase. Um, I, I, I basically left that flat at 32, or 33,000 um, for this first pass. <laughs> we got the taxes and insurance line. Uh, this has our directors and officers insurance flowing through our property insurance, our building flood. Uh, we saw a slight increase here for the year. Um, so there's an overage of roughly 12,000. Um, I left that line flat as well um, at the budgeted amount. Then we have our marketing and advertising line. Um, 150, we budgeted. Uh, the estimate for this year is 88,000. So there is favorability there, but we have not fully launched um, our programs and did our you know full out blown out marketing campaign, but we had campaign, but we have started uh, deploying some of those funds. So uh, you'll see this line uh, uh, is scaled down uh, to 110 uh, for the, the first iteration here. Um, and that's simply based on, you know, we, we, we moved that line up last year because we know we had to, to jumpstart these programs. And, and as mentioned, we, we've started some of that, but we still have a lot left over. So uh, so there's 110 there. Then we have the technology services line, um, 148,000 to uh, an estimate of 64,000 here. Um, a lot of this line uh, includes uh, just our, our IT services uh, that we have. Um, there's some web services uh, we have you know, slated a, a redesign of our website. Uh, we slated that to happen this year, but um, that did not happen. So that's something that we still have, have in play. Uh, but I did scale this line down by 10%. Um, so the, the first pass number is 133,000. Um, and then we have capital expenditures. Um, that number was 24,000 budgeted uh, to an estimate for this year of, 15,000 and uh, we didn't really do much here. We did purchase, uh, make some laptop purchases, uh, you know, uh, outright that fueled that line, but going into next year and having conversations with Kelly and her team, uh, we know that, and overall, we know that we need to make an investment in uh, a database, uh, all inclusive or <laughs> uh a customer relationship management system uh, that will fuel, you know, uh, moving these programs along and, and fuel hosting data and be able, being able to do analysis. So uh, that line has been pushed up to 70,000 to support that. Uh, so overall, you know, it's a, it's a slight, uh, uh, slightly lower than our budget from last year. And that's, that's, that's the idea is to, you know, try to do more with less, um, one thing to note is that we are aggressively looking into cheap capital, uh, grants, PRI, program related investments. We're having uh, a lot of conversations right now with assistance from our, one of our consultants, Quantified Ventures. And so, uh, you know, we're going to aggressively uh, go after grant dollars this year. And that line item is not shown in this iteration, but that will um, you know, help support some of this, the, the cushion to help support these, these programs as we get them started. Um, and we know we, you know, it takes a while to get these programs scaled up. Um, but we, we, we're well on our way in the multifamily side. And we know on a single family side, um, it takes a couple of years, but we'll start scaling up uh, and start producing uh, in the upcoming year. But I wanted to put this in front of you and, you know, just uh, get this out early and just see if you had any questions, see if, you know, if there's any other, uh, you know, if you would like to see more detail um, or just would like to see any, any other analysis going into, you know, these next couple of meetings or in the board. Retreat. So um, just wanted to put that out there. Any Thank questions? you, Byron. Thank you, Byron. I do have a one question, which is, which is, I, you know, I know we've been in the red. Is it, is it possible to kind of extrapolate out two, three years, four years to some sort of a, like a break-even analysis? Like, um, 
like what would it take um, income wise? And, you know, in some areas, like we've already done the, the most painful part, right? Which is, you know, building the, the systems and the processes um, and the know-how. Um, it's just hard to anticipate um, like, you know, what sort of volume might come in, um, you know, one, two, yeah. three years out. Yeah, certainly. Um, you know, so I can definitely provide um, or give you a snapshot, a look at, um, you know, maybe going out 10 years because, mm -hmm. uh, you know, on a single family side, um, a lot of the, you know, when these loans are paid off, we get, you know, we get our, our money back. But the average time frame of that is seven to 10 years. Right. So uh, we don't see a lot of that single family income early on, but we'll start right. to see it in that seven year, you know, eight year period. So um, that would be beneficial. And I can't, I can't show that. Um, yeah. That sounds, so, yeah. yeah kind of show where that, you know, where that, that revenue and that sink. Cause right. You know, looking at this, you know, just snapshot for one year right. that doesn't really tell a story. Okay. But yeah. So I, I can definitely do that. Other comments, observations? I think it's an excellent observation and comments that uh, you gave, Mr. Chairman. I think that extrapolating that data out over a 10 year period and seeing where or if we can reach a break even point would be excellent. But it looks like to me right now, even with the projected seven families at 500,000 and uh, looking at our losses of 1,500,000, we're losing about a million a year. And that's what we're taking out of our operating reserve. Um, I think three years ago, we had 12 million. Right now, it looks like we've got uh, close to 10, maybe nine, nine and change. Uh, looking at that and looking at the projected break-even point uh, looks like ten years. So, uh, of, of course, as as Mr. B Mr. Bucket said, we're aggressively looking at at different ways to produce income. But as realists, we need to take a look at exactly where we stand now and what is projected in the future. And when can we reach that break-even point? So I definitely agree with the chairman. That's my Thanks. only comment. Thank you, Chuck. Um, so Byron, is the plan, um, let's see, so we're October. So would you bring, how, do, how are you proposed proceeding? Obviously at some point this gets presented to the board. Yeah, so my, my thought was to, um, to put together uh, this report along with that long-term uh, projection at the board retreat. Hmm. Yeah. Um, and I can definitely provide the committee, uh, you know, send that out to the committee in advance of the, the retreat if needed. But that was the thought. And then we'll have, uh, we'll have a meeting, um, a board meeting in November so we can discuss the budget again, discuss what came out of the retreat. Or, you know, I could provide the updates based on, you know, another iteration based on what came out of the retreat. We have discussions there. And then of course we still have uh, December for the, for the final approval. Okay, thank you. You know what I'm wondering too, is for the, uh, the break even analysis, you know, on the revenue side, it would be helpful to know. I mean, because you know, you, you got the monetary amounts, but the idea is it's like this is premised on X number of, of these sorts of closings per year, uh, each of which generates you know Y dollars. Um, it's just helpful to, to see the counts involved um, because I mean, obviously, these are all obviously assumptions, but you know, you want it to be quote unquote reasonable. Um, sure. So. You're the saying the, the, the counts of the uh, like the pilot closings or the counts yeah, of the number yeah, exactly. of mortgage closings. Sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. the idea is, is like this assumes, um, you know, this year that we had 
10. I'm just making it up, right? And at, at an average value of blank dollars, which generates you know, this sort of revenue. And then you yeah. can all start to kind of chart it out. Just to, so the idea is, is that we get an idea of the number of relevant closings. And ideally, they're, they're realistic in light of our capacity. Right. You know, what we yeah. can generate. Yeah, great. Certainly. Yeah, I can definitely. Uh, awesome. I think, that, yeah, I look forward to it. Hey, Chair Wu, one comment about that. Um, you mentioned the uh, need to project it out, and Mr. Brown also mentioned um, the amount. He made note of the amount that we have budgeted for next year's revenue in multifamily and other programs and how uh, it still isn't quite enough to cover our expenses. Um, and one note on that type of revenue, we most of the deals that we have in that five are pilot only transactions. As a matter of fact, uh, of the five, four are pilot only and one includes uh, conduit bond issuance uh, on our behalf and the pilot. So there are, there, in terms of scaling the program up, um, it's not just adding more transactions to the fold, it's also uh, adding more of our resources to transactions. So uh -huh. when we start to issue bonds, using our balance sheet uh, to help them get a credit rating and, and sell the bonds as opposed to being a conduit only issuer. So they're, they're, we're trying to figure out the differences between the types of deals um, and the team is doing some uh, data gathering to figure that out. But I just wanted to let you know that even though we, we have five transactions closing this year, we could have five in another year and the revenue could look totally different because it might yeah. be five with pilots and bonds. Um, but we do have to, either way, we got to build consistency in terms of the types of deals that we can bring in and then what we can offer. Uh, and then that'll help us be more predict predictable with the revenue. Yeah, it's, it's, I don't know. I mean, obviously, I couldn't generate this analysis. Um, it seems like it would be somewhat tricky to, to figure out how to, to, to present it. But I mean, the, the idea though is, is just trying to, trying to figure out like, you know, what, what sort of products, what sort of offerings and how, how we might go about, you know, offering them and, you know, some of the variables as far as income that it might uh, generate. Um, so yeah, it's, I mean, again, it's, it's challenging. I, I look forward to, to yeah. insight um damien two, i think oh, i'm sorry uh, just two comments please uh, the single family program damon uh when you made your presentation and that's congratulations on the fact that you got a preliminary approval on the 30 million dollar bond issue were two things it come to my mind were any do you anticipate i know you expend anticipate cost of issuance it's going to cost us to issue we understand that was there any projected income that you have come to or mr buckage has come to that we might be able to generate from that bond issue if it became a reality that's just one question one and and, and sec go ahead i'm sorry mr brown and secondly from that's from the single family program one and uh the cost of issuance as opposed to pro 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 potential income and uh whether or not looking at the multifamily program which is what Wade is asking about doing, doing an analysis to include what you might project as income coming out of the bond issue. And the second thing uh, comes to my mind is, the, is, 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 is our single family program and whether or not we have resources to do soft second mortgages and where were those, I didn't see that anywhere in the budget. If, if we have a single family program, we're probably going to offer down payment and closing cost assistance. And how do we, I guess, budget or where will that come from? Because I haven't seen it anywhere. So those are the two questions I have. One, cost of vision. Secondly, 
down payment closed the cost assistance. Sure. That first question, uh, the bond issue that you're talking about, Mr. Brown, is actually a, a multifamily bond issue. And oh, that, I thought it was single. Yeah, I'm sorry. I didn't yeah, realize. No problem. Yeah, no problem. It's a multifamily issue, and it's the one bond issue that Mr. Badger talked about earlier, and he can give you the specific numbers, what we're expecting there. But uh, since it's a conduit multifamily bond issue, mm -hmm. uh, cost of issuance for us is zero. We're strictly a pass-through in that scenario, but there are revenues or fees associated with us being the conduit issue. We don't have much skin in the game, so we don't have to put up any dollars for cost of issuance. So that's one of the benefits of those conduit deals. And, and then um, secondly, as it relates to the single family program and down payment assistance, the way our green mortgage program is set up and the last few programs have been set this way, um, to remind the board, we have essentially two avenues for the single family program, uh, and two avenues to the market, I should say. One is the traditional way that we've gone to the market through the municipal bond market. The other route to produce a single family mortgages is through what's called the TBA or to be announced market. And that's basically the market where the commercial banks operate, the big mortgage companies, uh, that's the open mortgage market. So uh, since we are now operating in those two lanes, um, we still have to pick, pick up volume because our volume has not been where we know it can be and we haven't reached our potential yet. Um, so the TBA market is our focus right now. And in the TBA market, uh, again, we, it's more of a pass-through market. So we originate the mortgage. Investors are found uh, as we originate each batch of mortgages and then we sell those mortgages all right away. So they don't really hit our balance sheet in the same way that the, the, the assets and, and liabilities mm -hmm. balance sheet for a bond issue, a multifamily, mm -hmm. sorry, a muni bond issue. So um, getting down, down to the point, where does the money come from? The money in the TBA market, one of our advantages there is not tax exempt, but the one advantage that we do have is that we're able to sell our mortgages at a premium. And then we are also allowed to turn around and either loan or gift donate that premium to qualified home buyers in the form of down payment assistance and closing cost assistance. Mm -hmm. So we're able to generate our assistance as we originate the mortgage. So we don't have to come out of pocket for that assistance. It, uh, it, we only get the assistance if we generate the mortgage because it's a pricing mechanism or the way that we price those loans. And we have mm -hmm. Uh, a consultant, that's one of our uh, consultants that Mr. Badger also mentioned earlier. Um, Stiefel is the company that helps us originate those mortgages in the open market and package them and sell them. We get a cut of, of those fees. So mainly we haven't been making a lot of money on the single family program because it's transactional and they aren't very large transactional fees, um, mainly they're pasture fees. However, mm -hmm. We do have new iterations of the program that we're bringing forth at the end of this year, rolling into next year, uh, which should provide more economic benefit to Finance New Orleans for creating, originating, and packaging green mortgages. So as the volume picks up, we do expect more revenue on the single family side, but the real, you know, the real revenue is going to come once we get back into the muni buy market but we got to build up the volume to the point where we can enter the muni bond market uh, and then start to make those types of fees. And they accumulate as we do, you know, issue after issue each year. Uh, we'll look in that, at that 10 year analysis to see how long it's going to take that revenue uh, to turn around so that we can cover our expenses. So I'm sorry, that, that was a long winded answer, but I wanted to give you all the details. No. I, I fully I fully understood the answer, and it's a pass through on the bond issue. And you seek you're seeking to recover the down payment and closing cost assistance out of the transaction, uh, and 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 that's good. It's, so it's 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 zero income projected and zero output 
so there's no income. I'm, I'm, I guess I'm, I'm searching for ways by which we can improve our condition uh, from an income perspective. And it doesn't look like it appears to be in the single family market. I thought the 30, uh, that's one thing I made a mistake. I thought that $30 million was a bond issue that we traditionally do. That would be uh, uh, like our competitors, uh, Jefferson Paris advertises a down payment and closing cost assistance program. And I guess they're in the same, same market that you just described. Um, that's, that's, I understand now where we are from a board perspective as it relates itself to our single family program. We're not in a position now, uh, we're, we're looking at zero down payment closing cost assistance as an income and zero uh, uh, output uh, on our end because of the market that we're in traditionally like the other institutions are. So, um, um, excuse the comment, Mr. Chairman, I just was, was searching, that's all, searching based upon my experiences of how we have been able to generate resources. Right now, we're, we're a half million dollars uh, income, uh, and we're a million and a half in, in, in output, and so we're about a million a year, and, and, and I'm looking at ways by which we can capture that million dollar and reduce it to a point that we do have a break-even budget. And Mr. Brown, a little more clarity on that single family program. We do collect fees on for being a pass-through. It's just those fees aren't as large as they would be mm -hmm. uh, as if it were a bond issue. Uh, but yes. there are some new servicing arrangements that we've been looking into uh, that should that, that should generate more revenue for us on the, on our new green mortgage program. So mm -hmm. although the single family program will take a moment to get going, I do think it will have uh, enough activity and enough val volume that it can pay for itself down the line. It's just going to take us a moment to get there. Multifamily scales a whole lot faster, just to put it in context. We had zero multifamily revenue uh, just two years ago, two budget cycles ago. So now we're you know projecting over three hundred and fifty thousand dollars of multifamily revenue, and we think we can scale that number even higher, assuming that we have certain resources and elements in place. Um, but some of these programs are going to take a little longer to come online than others, uh, and then we haven't even talked about the infrastructure investment that we want to make, that's something that we're still studying and we'll add that to the picture down the line. But uh, the idea is that we think, and we'll show you in this 10 year projection where revenues can go, um, but we're not giving up on a single family program because it's still important. It's just gonna take a little while before it can pay for itself. Looks like there's one more agenda item, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, it's to go over the um, the market update and the financial status report. Yeah. Byron, I yield to you. All right. Let's see if I can advance one. All right, so I'll go over the market update, then move into the financial status report. Um, so the, uh, the global recovery, um, is from a, from a economic data standpoint, uh, seems to be still be an act despite there's a lot of supply chain issues going on. Um, the core inflation number is up by 4%, um, year over year, um, the monthly number was 5.4. It was driven by food and energy, um, which moved up materially. Um, there's been a cost of living adjustment in Social Security that was announced last week. Um, that benefit will rise by almost 6% next year. Um, and that's been the largest increase since 1982. So that just shows that inflation is still um, fairly hot. 
Um, and so that also uh, supports the case that the Fed has been um, has been talking about and 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 tapering their asset purchases. So um, so the you know everybody's looking at the Fed. If they start doing that, we'll start to see uh, rates increase, which we're we're seeing that now. Um, uh, we saw initial jobless claims fall last week, so the jobless reading is looking good. Um, and so we did see the benchmark bond rates uh, increase across the board. We saw munis increase, we saw the treasury increase, mortgage rates increase, um, all that's fueled by the inflationary pressures uh, and the prospects of the Fed's tightening their monetary policy. And then on the local side, we saw the unemployment rate actually decrease in Orleans Parish to 9% from the last reading that's available, which is in August. Um, it decreased to 9% from the prior month, which is 10.3. Uh, this just kind of shows, uh, gives you a look at the, the increase in overall long-term and short-term rates that I mentioned month over month. This is a yield curve of the Muni uh, curve. You'll see the the blue line is, is October and the green line is last month. So you'll see how, how rates are moving across the boards in Muni land. Um, and then moving into the uh, financial status report. Um, so this is September year to date. Uh, we're looking at revenues and expenses. You'll see revenues came in at 108,000 to a budget of 301,000. So there's a 200,000 shortfall there. On the expense side, the budget was 1.3 to 1.6. So there is favorability there. Uh, we've been running favorable you know, throughout the year. So there's uh, 291,000 favorability there. Uh, mainly driven by most of the categories, of course. This is our 13 month trending. Uh, you'll see um, everything's pretty much running within average at a slight increase um, in the month of September in the consultant and professional services line that, that kind of fluctuate throughout the year. But ideally, everything's running in, within average. Um, our balance sheet year over year is, uh, you know, the composition is pretty consistent. Uh, no, no major uh, issues or changes here. This is a look at our pathways portfolio um, year to date. Uh, we have our interest income uh, revenues of roughly 2000 and our, uh, the expenses, which is primarily uh, related to insurance um, or driven by insurance uh, at 33,000. And then finally, our cash uh, at the end of September is at 9.8, which is down. You know, we had that conversation about uh, our expenses are running roughly 150,000. So um, it's down by, you know, roughly um, 130,000, um, you know, uh, after taking out the, the revenue for the month. So 9.9 um, .9 last month, 9.8 this month. Any questions on the market update, the financial status report? None for me. Any other comments? <clears throat> Thank you, Byron. Thank you. Just the insurance <laughs> is coming probably from property insurance and flood insurance, aren't we? Oh, Byron. I'm sorry. The, the 21. The twenty-one uh, thousand—that's primarily flood insurance, uh, property insurance. Yes, sir. That's primarily property. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yep. No comment. Uh, Damon Byron, any any other points to discuss? That's it for me. I do have uh, one more question for the board. I know we don't have a full board here. We're trying to decide uh, how we're going to administer the annual retreat. We'd like to go back in person, but we, we want to know how the board feels about 
doing a retreat in person or continuing to uh, utilize the virtual option. Where are you thinking about doing it? At the moment, we're scheduled for November 8th. But where? Oh, well, with, yeah, we're looking at a few options at, uh, at present. Um, you know, some, some uh, ideas came to mind. In the past, we've done it on, on the, uh, at the River Room, at the Tulane office on the Mississippi River. Uh, we've also looked at City Park before. Uh, there's a, uh, uh, the name of the place, for me, but there's a place in Old Metairie that we've used for retreats in the past. So we're looking at multiple options, but before we get too far, we just wanna know if the board is even comfortable with us going in that direction. I mean, I just know uh, I'm involved with Tulane, the planning of Tulane activity worldwide abroad and um, it can be done. You just need to kind of consider the activity setting and ideally a, a reasonably sized room that has some decent ventilation. Um, and then we won't know if people are vaccinated or not. So I guess theoretically. That was going to be my question. Yeah. Right? Yeah. You uh, uh, and we have people, we have people wear masks. We're having that uh, with organizations that I'm involved in. Right. Uh, when you invite the public, uh, you have to have some idea of who's vaccinated. And, and who's not. Uh, we had a difficult situation happen to us where we had a public event and uh, we invited individuals from the public to come in and then somebody was contracted. Uh, um, I don't have as many concerns as many have because I just took my, at Ashna, took my, my booster shot a uh, couple of days ago, uh, a few days ago. But uh, it's very difficult with not knowing on a public event if everybody there uh, has been vaccinated. We've gone to a, a situation now where admittance into an, an event, an individual has to show uh, the, uh, the Louisiana vaccination. State ID. Yeah. yeah, vaccination or, you know, testing. So... Um, it sounds like you two are leaning more towards just continuing no, it. No, not, not necessarily, Damon. Um, ballpark, how many people you think would attend? And who will attend? And will they be vaccinated? Well, here's my thought. If you can give me a ballpark idea. I work with a bunch of folks at Tulane and Loyola who do this all the time. And I can – the other thing, too, is, is the city of New Orleans also has um, – certain restrictions in place, which I'm not sure whether it applies to us, but I can, I can do a little due diligence. Um, well, it would be at least the staff that's 13 plus the board seven. So 20 people. And then if we have to make it open to the public, you know, our, our consultants, yeah. they join us. So that's about five more people. Um, okay. So at, at a minimum 25 plus mm -hmm. whoever decides to join from. The yeah. So 25 to 30. Okay. Uh, I'll, I'll do a little, well, I mean, let's, so I, it's a possibility. Um, I, I can do some more due diligence and report back um, unless some folks are steadfast against it. Um, oh, not steadfast against it. But, okay. but Dr. Byron, have, have you done an inventory of your staff and consultants and some of the people that you anticipate inviting? And is it, I'm, I don't know if you can ask a person whether or not they've been vaccinated or not. Those are things that I, I really administratively yeah. would not even know. I, I mean, if, if, that. if we're lucky, the activity fits within the city uh, requirements. Like if you go to a restaurant now, technically you've got a, the restaurant's supposed to check if you're vaccinated or proof of a, a negative PCR test. I mean, in the, the best case scenario, oddly enough, is you'd want to, if you fell under that, then, um, then yeah, you'd, there'd be an expectation that we could ask for proof of vaccination or a negative test. Um, I don't know. I can, like I said, I can do some research. Yeah. And I, Mr. Yep. Brown, I Nash. haven't done an, an inventory. Um, so I'm not sure if Nash has. Nash, you're on mute. So, um, 
just being aligned with the city and the mandate um, for local restaurants and things like that, um, we can ask um, if they can, we can do, we can do this two ways, right? We could do contact tracing or um, we've implemented some crucial measures at the office where we take temperature and all that other kind of stuff along with our COVID policy. Um, but there are ways that we can, um, without violating HIPAA, you know, HIPAA privacy rights um, to confirm. And so I think what Damon's trying to do is just kind of get an idea being that the retreat is on the 8th, um, what folks want to do, because of course we have to work in advance and making sure that we find a secure space um, that allows social distancing um, and other um, COVID protective measures. So... I think the, the, the gist here is just, you know, chew on it. Um, Damon will propose it to the board, but we just kind of wanted to get an idea before we started, like getting the ball rolling. If that helps. I agree. Okay. Short window. The okay. 8th of November. Yes. Okay. Uh, anything else, Damon? No, thank you. Thank you. Thanks to the staff too. Appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank you. Let's okay. go, Elizabeth. Please adjourn. Thank you. Um, so much. There are no public comments at this time. So we're able to adjourn. Take care, everybody. I move for adjournment. Okay. Bye. Thank you. Have a good evening. Thank you. Have a good